Hi, and welcome to School of Hustle. I'm your host, Sarah, and this is the show where we chat with everyday entrepreneurs about everything that goes into starting a new venture. The restaurant industry employs 15.6 million jobs, and they had $863 billion in U.S. sales in 2019, the majority of which being small, family-owned businesses with less than 50 employees. And our next guest is the co-founder of one of my favorite New York restaurants, Dave Ethan of The Gray Dog. The Gray Dog was started on a quiet West Village street in 1996 by two brothers, Dave and Pete, who decided to open a restaurant with no prior business experience. Their mission was simple, to create a place where people wanted to be, and guess what? It worked. Today they have five locations and are known for their delicious, locally produced food and welcoming atmosphere. It's an absolute pleasure having you on the show and being in your new location here in the Flatiron. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, I've been a big fan of the Grey Dog since college, and I love your vibe. I love the food here. So tell me about this. Tell me about how you started the Grey Dog. Where did the idea come from? You and your brother had never started a business, so why why decide, let's start a restaurant together? All right. Um, so Pete and I were working in New York City at the time doing, you know, basically restaurant work. Mm. Um, and I was working for this guy who, he, he wasn't terribly bright, but... <laughs> He, he was really good at what he did in a cafe, and it gave me the confidence to be like, oh man, if this guy can make this work, <laughs> I, can, I definitely. can definitely do this too. <laughs> so wow. I got together with Pete, and we were both, we were both feeling like, it's sort of confident, yeah. and we had a little bit of money saved up. Like maybe, maybe I had 25,000 bucks, okay. and he probably had like uh, closer to 40. But back in those days, you could do something. Right. You can actually do something with that money. Yeah. And so, you know, he, he went around, walked around, tried to find an area that didn't have a Starbucks or any other coffee shops and said, hey, Dave, I think I found the spot. There's nothing around here. <laughs> and without and really knowing thing. the neighborhood at all, we, we called the number on the store. There was a landlord's number. Mm -hmm. Called them up, set up an appointment, and like... I don't know, like a, a week later, we had a lease and, <laughs> and you know, no game plan. How do you decide on what type of restaurant to actually bring into this location that you found in such a laid back way? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you gotta go with what you know. Right. Right, and so we were just a coffee shop back then. Oh, okay. Um, Did you serve like little things to go with the coffee? like? Biscuits and cookies. Right, and we like we that. ordered in baked goods, muffins, and stuff, but we didn't really have much of a menu. Okay. It was really it, it was predominantly going to be a coffee shop. Oh. We take this space and it's got a kitchen, right? But but we, you didn't need a kitchen. But we originally. didn't need a kitchen, so we were just storing stuff in the kitchen because oh. it was all right, put all that stuff back there. You know, we don't we don't need it. So customers would come in with groceries and say, Hey, you mind if I use the kitchen? And what? I'm just going to make myself. An omelet. This is, I'm just, see, this is what I mean. This <laughs> restaurant is so laid back that a customer would come in. They'd clean up after themselves. They were just looking for a home. They were wow. looking to hang out. And so our menu started to develop in a way where like, well, if this guy wants a burger, let's put a burger on the menu. If this guy wants an omelet, let's do that. And pretty soon we had a fairly expansive menu that you know had basically everything that our customers wanted. So you really just kind of chose the items on the menu based off of what customers asked for or made in your kitchen. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, I mean, it's not totally the case, but yeah, pretty much. So it's called the Gray Dog. Can you talk about why it's called the Gray Dog? Because I always was curious myself. Yeah, I, which version do I give you? Um, <laughs> back when Pete and I were dreaming up this idea, mm -hmm. um, we're sitting on our law in this loft apartment that, you know, I think it was probably an illegal rent at the time. <laughs> and we don't really have, we don't have kids. We don't have wives. We don't, I don't even think we have, we don't even have girlfriends at the time. We're, we're or friends. Two bachelors living yeah. in an illegal I don't, apartment. I don't even think we had friends. Sounds like <laughs> New York. <laughs> uh, but we had our dogs. He had a black lab. 
named Goose, and I had a yellow lab named Moose. We were sitting on the couch, and I don't know if anybody was smoking or if we were drinking, but you know, I'm like, hey, you know, it's just us. Why don't we combine their colors? <laughs> and you know, you take a yellow dog that's really kind of white and a black dog, you put them together, and you got a gray dog. Yeah. And that's. <laughs> That's the gray dog. So it was a morphed dog between your two dogs. A morphed dog between our two dogs because it was, you know, two brothers morphing an idea. Yeah. Wow. It made sense at the time. I would have never guessed it's, that was the story. <laughs> people spend a lot of money these days coming up with, and, you know, concepts. But That's, you know, you're a testament to just keep it simple and deliver what customers want because that's working perfectly. Yeah. Don't overthink it. Right. It's like back to basics and basics never fail. Right. Basics never fail. <laughs> Basic, <Yeah>. you know. <laughs> in our, <laughs> in our prison like interview. Yeah. <laughs> everything's basic today. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You mentioned that you had some savings to fund the restaurant, but I know restaurants in New York, it's very expensive real estate often very low margins. So how did you go about funding this and making sure that it will work long term? Um, we, we were pretty careful. I mean, it took us 24 years to get to this many restaurants, mm -hmm. but it took, it took us 10 years to go from one to two. Wow. And back then, we weren't making a lot of money. We were doing mm -hmm. it because we were, we were having fun. Yeah. Um, and that it always, it always had to stay fun. And, and then we saved. And when it got to the point where we could afford number two mm -hmm. and it wasn't going to sink number one if it didn't do well, we, we took a shot. Mm -hmm. And that one did better than number one. Really? So, Why do you think that did better than number one? Uh, it hit the right crowd. Um, oh. Was it, it, a diff it was a different location that maybe was like more appropriate for it was university shop. place so oh, M it was for, nyu it was this was this is your union square location yeah. that's the first one i ever went to that's the first one most people go to because yeah. we we get there i guess there's a migration where mm -hmm. we get you know all the college kids mm -hmm. and then as they expand throughout the city we get them all the way up through having their own kids now yes so. this is accurate because yeah. i'm literally that person <laughs> that's it yeah <laughs> so you know very well it, that was that was the home run location yeah. that was and then know, after that so it took 10 years to get to two you got to two and it sounds like that did very well quickly so how long until you got to number three well this is where this is where like things got taken out of our hands a little bit, oh, it, wow. right? Because there wasn't, and Pete and I didn't really have these plans to expand and make it a mm -hmm. you know multi-chain restaurant. So in in the process of the ten years, Pete had established a killer catering business okay. that we were running out of the basement of the Carmine location. Mm -hmm. So ten years, in, uh, probably twelve years in, the landlord gets frisky with the rent and mm. he starts causing trouble and saying, I'm going to take away your basement space. I want this. I want that. Because he heard you're being successful, so he wants a part of it. He wanted to be a partner. So Was that legal with your contract that you had? It's just, I mean, not, none of it's legal. It's just business. That's the way right. New York works. And yeah. if you have a good a good relationship with the landlord, you could you could work it out. For sure. Um, we had trouble, so he took away our catering space. We looked for another space um, that would have a huge basement. So mm -hmm. that's how we wound up in the Chelsea location. It wasn't out of, let's get bigger and bigger. It was out of, man, we got to save the catering business. Let's find yeah. a space that isn't too expensive and has a huge basement. Oh, okay. And then a year later, Google opened up across the street. Wow. And it was Lu just like, oh, man, this, this is pretty lucky. And that's a really cool location. Yes. So here we are growing, growing, and, and you know, it's working out. But it, it's not planned. It's still not planned. Um, nothing's planned yet. It's, you say it's not planned, but you can't ignore that you guys are really good at what you do. You know, like... 
I feel like you're being very modest right now because the food is great. And what I've always been impressed with is no matter which gray dog I go into, I feel like I'm family. It, it worked out because we never stopped having fun. Yeah. And we never, we never treated it like a business. Where yeah. it was, we treated it, we treated it like, hey, the, you know, a lot of restaurants would say this is our family. The staff is, you know, family. But my team really feels that way. They really felt that way. And they've always, it, you know, it, it's, it became about the staff. Yeah. Where they made the customers feel so damn good that the customers were able to, you know, come in and they didn't focus on some of the things that weren't so restaurant quality. There's, yeah. I don't know what things you're talking about, but I think I think everything's restaurant quality. That's, Speaking of the food, uh, you guys focus on locally sourced ingredients. Uh, most of your food comes from New York and Connecticut within 200 miles, within reason. Obviously, you can't get an avocado grown here. Right. Uh, why did you decide to do that? Um, when we when we decided that we were gonna actually go for it. We're net, we got a game plan in place where we're, okay, now we're gonna, now we're gonna grow. Yeah. Now we're gonna take on some investment and what, money. How many years did that take for you to say, okay, now let's, let's really take on invest money and grow? 23 years. <laughs> so last year. Great. Last okay. year. So we, we brought in investment money. Mm -hmm. We brought in a team of really talented people. Um, Alan is our, is our chef and he's, but he, he's the type of guy where he knew the, he knew the food we were doing was not, you know, a lot of chefs don't want to spend their time making, you know, avocado toast. You know, yeah, they, sure. they want to thrill the world <laughs> with stuff, but he was all about, let's, let's pay people livable wages and let's bring in everything locally that we can. He partnered up with a bunch of farms around mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. um, and started creating a menu that would be, you know, really responsible. Are there any local farms you work with that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, we, we love working with Rocksteady Farm. It's a local farm. Um, Again, one of those partnerships that mm -hmm. I could be super proud of. Yeah. We even have a cocktail named after them, really? the Rocksteady. So. Oh, Rocksteady. Nice. Whatever they grow, we figure out a way to put into our menu. So is it is it mainly vegetables or do you get fruits from them too? Uh, whatever they have. They have great flowers too. Oh, um, nice. I, I went up there. That Oh, this is a cool story, right? So yeah. we go up to this farm as a group. Um, whenever we get the opportunity and they put us to work. So I think I, I spent one day eight hours weeding their flower beds. Oh it's my goodness. Like filled with bugs and dirt. And <laughs> it was, it, but it was one of the most satisfying days yeah. I've had in the last year. Yeah. And just knowing, like seeing the field where we're getting all our food, I never had that experience. Right. You know, it was back in those days when it wasn't really a focus, you know, where the tomatoes were coming mm -hmm. from. But now I'm like, oh, damn. Those are, those you see it direct from the source, so you yeah. know how good it really is. Yeah, and they're, they're like, hey, can we uh, bum a ride to the city with this for you? <laughs> yeah. Now, I heard that there's a very interesting story involving bread and a motorcycle. Can you please share this story with me? Yeah, we got to go back. Okay. We, we got to go back to the beginning. So, okay. So the, the guy who was bringing all the bread that we were making the sandwiches with, mm -hmm. his name was Rick, Sticky Rick. He had a bakery in the East Village, Sticky Fingers. He's not Sticky there Rick anymore. Sticky Rick in the East Village. Yeah, or he doesn't was, get more New York than that name. You know, oh, he was great. He, he, was, uh, he, he was in the Hells Angels and had a beard down to here. Wow. Tats everywhere, gigantic guy, bullet holes like everywhere. Bullet holes? Yeah, he'd been shot several times. Oh, like actual Real, bullet scars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he would deliver our bread on the back of his chopper. Wow. But we had these French doors that would open up and he would drive the chopper right into the store. Oh my God. <laughs> hey Dave. All right, he'd call me boy. Boy, here's your bread. <laughs> oh my goodness. I miss that guy. That's amazing. So how did the investment help your business expand? Uh, well, I mean, it gave us the capital we needed to mm -hmm. 
turn turn a mom and pop shop into a real business. Yeah. He, uh, I was contacted by this guy Johnny Hill, who you know has become our partner. Mm -hmm. um, but he he reached out and said asked if we had any interest in expanding. And so he and I went for a walk around Chinatown. And after about three hours, we realized, oh man, there's a connection here. He was in the investment world. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wanted to do good investments for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. So he created a company called Lanyap that would be focusing entirely on investing into companies that are going to make the planet better. Um, companies that would focus on being green, companies that would focus on living wages. It, it, it's what he wants to do. So he made a promise to all his investors. Um, he's like, okay, I'm going to set this up. Our first investment is going to be Grey Dog, and we're going to turn them into a B Corp. We're going to. What are the benefits of a B Corp? Uh, the benefits of B Corp, there's really none for the business. Mm -hmm. It's just you feel you feel good. Because um, if B Corp means that you're socially responsible and you're doing all these things to help the environment, correct? Is that what it means? It, you're socially responsible. You're doing all these things to, <laughs> to, <laughs> for the environment. You're, you're just... You know, like Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's. They're, gotcha. yes. they're companies that you can feel really good about supporting. Okay. Business as a force for good. Business as a force for good. Got <laughs> <laughs> B Corp is a framework for using business as a force for good. B Corp. <laughs> what changes are you guys doing in your business today? Um, well, starting with the reboot of Grey Dog, which this is Grey Dog 2.0. This flat location, iron the yep. Flatiron, which yep. is where we're shooting from. So we, we have this amazing dude, Sam, who he's probably in my head right now. <laughs> he created this as a B, as we're, we're getting to be a B Corp. We're mm -hmm. close okay. for this location, but now we're a green restaurant space here and with Alan, our food is just going towards more and more local. Um, and our staff, now everybody, you know, with Melissa at the helm of HR, you know, everybody gets a living wage now. This is all stuff that doesn't really happen in the restaurant yeah. world. So now we're in your new location. It's coming mm -hmm. together beautifully. What does it take to get something like this started? Because me looking around, I mean, there's a lot going on here. It takes a pandemic ending. <laughs> Great. That's the first thing. Still working um, on that. Right. This one was the first time that Pete and I had to collaborate with other people. You know, now we, mm -hmm. had, now we had a lot of people who are significant players in the company who would be like, well, I think the beam should be lower or uh. the sandwich selection needs to be this. So it took, us, it took us quite a while just to get comfortable in making decisions together. Right, because before it was just you and uh, Pete. It was, it was just us, and it was like, I'd be like, there was a lot of trust. Right. And I was like, hey, you got this, man. You know what you're doing. Yeah. And I had never bothered, I had never bothered to question anything Pete would do. He was, you know, right. he was brilliant in my mind. He's still brilliant in my mind. Um, we were just having fun. And then he'd be like, all right, you got this. I don't have to think about it. So you it. guys kind of, uh, you would do certain aspects and he would do certain aspects. And mm -hmm. you always did that for all the other locations. Yeah, absolutely. But now this one, because you have an investor, you have to clear everything by them. We, right. We had to, we had a new set of standards we had yeah. to work with. You mentioned the pandemic. Obviously that was a devastating thing to happen to many restaurants um, worldwide. Uh, what have you done to try to move forward after something like that happening and having to close down your restaurants for multiple months and only having outdoor dining? Um, yeah, um, we, we're staying positive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's all we can do. We've been dealt we've been dealt a hand that. Yeah, I mean, it, it sucks, it, it, yeah. it, but it sucks for a lot of people. Yeah. We're trying to make a go at it. We've actually, 
you know, we, we had to do everything on the fly, right? We've never done table service, right? But right. We, we learned in the first two weeks, you know, we still set up a kiosk outside. My brother made these incredible, you know, incredible stands, like a lemonade stand for everybody. And, and we were doing like 60 bucks a day. And we're like, oh boy, this isn't gonna work. And so we, we got permission to go out into the street um, like everybody else. And we built these pretty cool spaces, but we were still using this kiosk style and we weren't doing well. And then it was like a quick pivot. All right, yeah. table service. Well, Grey Dog's never done table service. Right. And it's, it's difficult to you know, create the illusion for customers when Mm, you know, I know. Hi, yo, know, I got gloves on, protective gear. And they can't and, see smiles. I know. Right. It's, so it's hard. He, um, but you do it. And we're actually we're actually we're we're kicking ass at it. I'm That's super great. proud of our team. They're like the whole setup's nuts. You gotta I know. bring a <laughs> whole stage out. Like when we set this thing up today, it was yeah. like two hours and it's just, you know, umbrellas and cameras and stuff. <laughs> Imagine that you know every day you have to put your dining room outside. I then, can't imagine you yeah. have to show up to work earlier than before because everything has to be set up outside. And pretty much, it takes yeah. a while. It, whatever, whatever it is, the city feels it feels kind of special. Yeah, it feels like it's just for the locals. Yeah, yeah, and which it, is cool because Grey Dog is my like the local spot. It, we've been lucky to become that. How are you handling your marketing right now since it's such a different vibe that it's, it's just such a different atmosphere at the Grey Dog and trying to keep those customers happy? And what are you guys doing? Um, we, we do a moderate like amount social of media social media, media but it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not something that we've ever gotten really strong at. Is it mainly um, word of mouth, would you say? We've always been word of mouth. Yeah. So for you, it seems like, and I think this is what any successful business owner would do, you hire people for skills that you're not good at. Um, <laughs> that would be everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, please. You're um, good at the interaction, and that's why you have repeat customers, because they come for you, they come for the food, they come for the atmosphere. I, I think learning what you're not good at and knowing that you could trust other people to do yeah. it, that's been one of my biggest learning curves. Instead of trying to do everything, yeah. which for years I was under every sink fixing every leak and on Ooh. the roof fixing ACs and like li literally I did it all. Yeah. Um, and now we're at a, in a place where I, I have an amazing team that you know I trust. You know they know what they're talking about. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. And that's the natural expansion of any business. You know, you have people that help you with these things. Mm -hmm. So here's my final question for you. Mm -hmm. As a successful restaurateur with five restaurants in New York City, which is arguably the most competitive city in the world, um, do you have any advice for aspiring restaurateurs? This one's pretty easy because I think I probably sit down with two or three people a month who mm -hmm. have reached out and asked me that question. Oh, really? And so I, I kind of have a, a standard a standard line where I, I tell them, hey, get a job in the industry. You know, start yeah. that way. Don't just start out. Everybody has this fantasy. Mm -hmm. I want to open up a cafe with my significant other and we're going to have this wonderful lifestyle. <laughs> and it's like, you gotta you gotta learn the language of the restaurant. You gotta yeah. you, you know it's not you're not dealing with the Boy Scouts. It's you know there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of stuff out there that it takes some grit to get through. Yeah. And what you walk in when you walk into per se that's that's heaven. But they're behind the scenes. I imagine there's some there's some significant changes. Oh, you know, for and sure. So get a job in the industry. That's, and then you can take the next step. Learn if you like it, you know, mm -hmm. and if, and then, you know, figure out the language, figure out how to talk to the people and, you know, develop a relationship with the people who are really going to make things happen for you. And if you get that, if you, once you get there, then yeah, take the dive. The second one, which has been really the secret to our success is do everything for your staff. 
mm -hmm. right? Give them the schedule that they need. Give them, create, create the environment that they're gonna succeed in. Once you've done that, they're gonna wanna come to work because they are gonna know it's a special place. Yeah. And if you open up a company that you know, doesn't put them first, it's gonna show. Yeah. I, at least I think so. I mean, this is what we've done and it wasn't a game plan. It was just, you know, that's Treating who, people with respect. Yeah, that's who we that's who we were from day one. Right. We we never we never altered from that because we didn't even know we were doing it. It was just natural. It was like, Which of is course, good. Yeah, that's how you do it. Like yeah. how can you not? You know? Um in this city everybody's an actor, everybody's a perform you know everybody's performing in some degree. So mm -hmm. work around their stuff. Let them dream. Yeah. And if if their dream could coincide with, you know, this dream. I think you got something. So that's wow. it. Wow. Well, that is incredible advice. It's been so amazing having you in the show and also so hilarious. <laughs> You're such an interesting guy. Right. So thanks so much for joining us. And thank you everyone who tuned in today. And if you want to learn more about The Gray Dog, visit thegraydog.com. Follow them on Instagram at thegraydognyc. But better yet, why don't you step into one of their five Manhattan locations and try some of their delicious food and I promise you, your taste buds will thank you. It's that good. So that's all for this edition of School of Hustle. Keep up with all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you stream and download podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave a review, share with your friends, and subscribe to our show. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.